The following program is a presentation of Winchester Academy. Well, good evening, and thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity to be here, and like you said, the opportunity to come back to Wapaka County, where I was raised, and really pleased that even tonight my parents were able to join, so happy to have them here uh, in the audience as well. Um, so I, I, I'm really, really touched, moved that all of you folks wanted to come and learn about how elections work in the state of Wisconsin. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight, I'm not here to tell you what you should think or what you should believe about Wisconsin elections. What I want you to see is where you can get involved in the process, uh, what the process is, what the law says about our elections, and then um, you know, hopefully you'll all go see for yourselves exactly how elections work in your community. Because as we'll talk about, we have more opportunities to engage with the process directly here in Wisconsin than any other state in the country. So what we're going to talk about tonight is uh, securing Wisconsin's elections, who's involved in that process, what do the various levels of government do uh, to secure Wisconsin elections, and then how is that done? What, what is the process? Um, so to start out with, you can't start a story about Wisconsin elections without talking about how we are the most decentralized election administration system in the entire country. And what does that mean? That means that in other states, they might have counties that run elections, and they might have 50, they might have 15, like some states like Arizona, uh, but the elections are run at the county level. And so again, they might have 50 to 100 local election officials. Here in the state of Wisconsin, does anybody know how many local election officials we have? Good guesses, good guesses. We have 1,850 cities, towns, and villages that each run elections. So those wonderful folks that you saw raise their hands, those are people serving their communities as their local election official in every city, town, and village. And so when I say we're the most decentralized, you know, keep that in mind throughout this, that we don't have the opportunity here to put all of our clerks into one room and train them uh, like they do in other states because we have so many. And in addition to that 1,850, there are also 72 county clerks uh, that serve a very important role as well. And so um, keep that in mind when we talk about all the ways Wisconsin elections are secured because they are really done on the ground level more than any other state in the entire, entire country. <clears throat> Um, another thing to keep in mind is that elections is considered national critical infrastructure. Um, and this will come into play with some of the partners that we work with to secure elections. Um, but just like utilities, transportation, other things that are considered by the Department of Homeland Security to be so important to our functioning as a society that we're declared as critical infrastructure, elections is one of those sectors as well. Um, so elections has been added to that list of critical infrastructure uh, sectors for uh, the country. And that designation happened in 2017. Um, another thing that we do when we're talking about you know, the federal level and how they're involved in securing elections is funds come from the federal government to help with election security. Uh, so many of the initiatives to secure elections in Wisconsin aren't budgeted for in our local communities. Um, I like to say, you know, in some of our small jurisdictions, if somebody's calling every day to a small township and saying, there's a pothole in front of my house, please come fix it, and they start to get grumpier and grumpier about that pothole, right? Your town government is probably going to spend money to come fill that pothole. Nobody ever calls and says, my clerk needs a new computer, right? Make sure my clerk gets a new computer. I want that before I want my pothole filled. And so this federal money is really important to ensuring that our local governments have what they need. And so this is a breakdown of the funding we've received since 2018 um, across the nation and in the state of Wisconsin to help with securing elections. Um, one thing I'll remind you when you're looking at those totals, so most recently $1.2 million, is we have to figure out a way to meaningfully split that pie 1,850 different ways. And that's a real challenge. But I think we've done some pretty incredible things here. We've offered grants to allow our local municipal clerks 
to buy a computer uh, that meets the security standards because many of them were buying their own. Many of them didn't have any sort of budget in their local jurisdiction to even buy a computer. So they were buying their own and they were 15 plus years old. And so federal money allowed us to make sure everybody had a computer to be able to run elections in their jurisdiction, to make sure that they all had IT support, and to make sure they had some money to attend a training. Because we do a lot of training uh, that you know, sometimes is better in person, and we wanted them to have a small amount of funds to be able to travel to that training. Um, so that's sort of a breakdown of some of the federal funding uh, that we received through the Help America Vote Act. Um, who else is involved? So we talked about the federal level, uh, the state, the county, and the municipal level are all involved in, in securing elections here in Wisconsin. Um, still speaking about the federal level, the Department of Homeland Security, again with that critical infrastructure designation that allows us access to things like funds and services through the federal government to help protect our cyber, cyber security posture. Uh, we also work with the FBI. Uh, they have a task force with USDOJ that's focused on threats against elections. Um, and so we're able to partner with them too when those scenarios do arise. Um, and then there's the US Election Assistance Commission. And just like their name uh, hints to you, uh, they assist with uh, sharing best practices uh, across the country amongst election officials. And they actually have a commission, much like our model here in Wisconsin, which we'll discuss. Um, there's also a number of other important federal agencies. Uh, in most other states, they have a Secretary of State. They have an organization, Department of Defense, uh, making sure our military voters can get their ballots. Uh, all those organizations are involved in making sure that we have secure elections and that everybody is able to participate. The state level. So now coming down to the state level, we have the Wisconsin Elections Commission. And I definitely want to spend some time here because this is a very, very unique model. Um, just like our decentralized systems, how the state runs elections is very unique to other states as well. In 40 other states, you have a Secretary of State that's a single elected official that runs elections. They're able to make decisions unilaterally they don't have to make those decisions in a public meeting. Of course, they're accountable to the voting public, right? In the state of Wisconsin, we have an elections commission. Uh, we don't have a secretary of state that's involved in running elections. And the elections commission is made up of six commissioners, three Republicans and three Democrats. And they're all appointed by legislative leadership. So the legislature gets to directly appoint all six of our commissioners. Then the administrator, that's me, I serve at their will. So I don't have a vote on the commission. The commission has to meet in public meetings. And anytime, let's say, there's a court decision, uh, let's say there's some type of directive that we want to give to the local clerks uh, about a law, the commission has to meet in a public meeting. And you can live stream these. You can go onto our website, and you can actually see the meeting minutes from all of those deliberations. But they need four votes of the commission to implement a directive. And then my job is to implement whatever the commission decides. Uh, so if I don't have four votes of the commission, I can't move forward. And I have to move forward with whatever the commission directs. Uh, and again, that's in a public meeting, which I think is a pretty neat part of our process, is you can actually watch that meeting happen. You can watch those decisions as they're made. Uh, in real time. And you can even submit public comment. So let's say you see a commission meeting agenda, a topic you feel passionate about. You're actually able to submit public comment in writing or attend a commission meeting. And you can tell them your opinion on a subject that they can then use that feedback uh, as they make their decisions. Um, we also, so the, the administrator, that's my role. I serve as what, what's called the chief election officer for the state. And so like we talked about in other states, uh, you have a Secretary of State. Here you have the administrator that serves at the will of the Wisconsin Elections Commission. And we have a number of things that we're charged with, but we're not the ones at the state level that register voters. We don't issue absentee ballots. We don't manage the voter rolls. And I bet for a lot of people, that's sort of a surprise to hear that the state is not the one that does that. Uh, but that's actually our local clerks, which we'll talk more about their role. Because again, 
the municipal level, that's where almost everything happens as it pertains to election administration in Wisconsin. Uh, but we do provide some of the technological applications that our local clerks use. Um, so our clerks are required to use a statewide voter registration database. This is where they enter voter registration records. It's where they issue absentee ballots and track those ballots and make sure that they've been returned and, and issued appropriately. And it's where they also make sure that the right people are on your ballot. Make sure that your ballot has the right contest you're eligible to vote in. We manage that technology. Uh, we are not the custodians of that data. The data is all the local election officials. Uh, we also provide a lot of technical assistance uh, to our clerks because again, in those small jurisdictions, almost none of them have any type of IT support. And so we're able to work with our state division of enterprise technology to help a clerk if they find themselves with some type of cyber event. Uh, we're able to work with the, the state to deploy resources to them. That's where the Department of Administration come in, comes in. So we have the Division of Enterprise Technology. And uh, I like to describe their process as sort of a volunteer firefighter process. Um, so they basically train IT professionals around the state. And then if another government entity has an incident, they deploy that cyber response team to help that clerk or school district or whatever it might be. And so that's something that we're able to benefit from too and our clerks are able to utilize. Uh, we also work with the Department of Justice in the state of Wisconsin. They serve as our, our legal counsel um, and the Department of Military Affairs. Um, I'm actually really pleased to have been appointed by our state's adjutant general, who's in charge of the National Guard, as one of his state uh, security advisors. Uh, county clerks. So moving on from the state, county clerks uh, they have some really important roles in elections, but they're not doing the same things that county clerks do in other states. Uh, so our county clerks, they're the chief election officer of their county. Uh, they're all elected. So they're actually partisan individuals uh, that are serving in each of your counties. And the county clerks uh, have a really important role in preparing and printing the ballots for their municipal clerks. Uh, so every election, when those ballots have to actually be prepared and you have to make sure that the right people are on the ballot, that's the county clerks that are doing that preparation. They then print the ballots and distribute them to their municipal clerks. Uh, the county clerks also do some work after the election in terms of needing to post the unofficial results from all the municipalities on their website. Uh, so that's another county level responsibility. That being said, a lot of our county clerks, uh, present company included, do a lot more than this, right? They, they serve as a conduit uh, for a lot of other information to their local clerks. Uh, many of them even contract with their municipality to handle some of the more technical responsibilities, uh, to do some of the training for their local jurisdictions as well. And so it's a really important role uh, here in the state of Wisconsin. Oh, redistricting and uh, line uh, management of wards and districts. Uh, that's another thing that happens a lot at the county level is anytime there's redistricting and annexation, a change in the boundaries and wards for your jurisdiction, the counties usually have the departments that are going to manage that land information and provide it to their jurisdictions as well. So city, town, and village clerks. This is really where it all happens in terms of running elections. Um, so our city, town, and village clerks are the ones that are doing all of the really practical stuff when it comes to elections. Um, so first off, they're the ones that register voters. A municipal clerk in the state of Wisconsin is the only one that can register a voter. So everybody has to be registered to vote in order to receive a ballot. When you fill out your voter registration, that's going to your city, town, or village clerk. They're the ones that are reviewing that registration application, ensuring that you've provided all the information that's required by law. Uh, that includes things like your proof of residence document that proves where you live. And only your municipal clerk can make that determination on whether or not uh, that is a lawful registration that should be entered into the system and added to the voter rolls. Um, 
at the, at the polls on election day, there's also what's called election registration officials. And so these are poll workers that have been chosen and trained by your municipal clerk to conduct that process as well. Um, but you actually can't register to vote with your county clerk. You can't register to vote in another government office. Um, you have to register to vote with your municipal clerk. Uh, there is one exception to that, and that is online voter registration, which is allowed by law, a law that was passed in 2016. And that law says that if all your information on your driver license matches with your voter registration information, you're able to register to vote online. Uh, but still, that information goes to your municipal clerk who makes the decision on whether or not your information should be added to the poll book. Municipal clerks are required to track all that information in what we call the WIS vote system, our statewide voter registration database. Uh, so whenever somebody registers to vote, uh, they're going to enter that information. If somebody's no longer eligible to be registered to vote, your municipal clerk is going to be the one that reviews that information and takes them off the poll book, right? Because only lawful registered voters can be on the poll book, can be issued a ballot. And so your municipal clerk is the one that both adds voters to the rolls and is removing them if they were to be deceased, uh, if they were to become a felon, or otherwise ineligible. Uh, municipal clerks also train election inspectors. And I know we've got a couple of election inspectors here tonight as well. And uh, that is a responsibility that falls on your municipal clerk. So in every city, town, and village, they're the ones that choose their polling places, that set up their polling places, and that train their poll workers as well. All that happens at the municipal level. And so the training can really vary from municipality to municipality. There is some training that happens for our chief inspectors, uh, which the law does give the state the responsibility to provide training for them. Uh, so it's a little more consistent. Um, municipal clerks, they're also the ones that are going to be you know, working with their other departments in, in their municipality. So be that their police department, their utilities, street, IT, uh, to make sure that their election is run well. Um, we do also, the municipal clerks uh, are also, you know, and I think this is important to, to point out as well, they're the only ones that issue ballots. So when you put in your request for an absentee ballot, uh, your request for an absentee ballot goes to your municipal clerk. And your municipal clerk, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to look to see that you're registered to vote. Um, so they're going to say, does this person who put in a request, are they registered to vote? Are they eligible to get a ballot? If they make the determination that, yes, this person is eligible, they're lawfully registered to vote here, then your clerk is going to send you an absentee ballot. The clerk is going to track that in the statewide system. Then when you send back your absentee ballot, the clerk is going to do those same checks again, right? They're going to say, OK, did I issue this ballot? Is this person still lawfully registered to vote? And if they are indeed, then your clerk is going to uh, hold that ballot until election day. And your absentee ballot is actually going to be sent down to your polling place where it's going to be processed in public uh, at the polls on election day. Um, voters, election observers, and political parties. You know, another really important role here is just everyone, all the voters in Wisconsin, election observers, political parties. Uh, people have the opportunity to observe all the processes in elections. So election observers are a really important part of our process in that they can go to their polling places. Anybody can be an observer. You don't have to have special training. You don't have to have special credentialing. You can go to any polling place in the state of Wisconsin, sign in, and observe. Uh, let's say you trust your elections here in Wapaka, but you've got questions about how they work in another place. You've got questions about how they work in Milwaukee. You could actually go and observe that process. And you could go and see uh, the entire election process in any jurisdiction. So we have a very open election observer process here in Wisconsin as well. Uh, voters and election observers and parties, all those folks can also you know, report things. If somebody has actually seen or observed some type of wrongdoing, you know, that should go to law enforcement or through the administrative complaint process that the Elections Commission has. Uh, so we have a complaint process where if somebody has observed something and is able to swear to that information, the commission will actually take a look at that. And it's the first stop before that matter goes to circuit court. Uh, but the commission, 
they decide a lot of those complaints um, every year, and you can actually see those decisions on the Elections Commission's website. Um, so people that have filed those sworn complaints and have had a decision that has been rendered in those. Um, so getting into kind of the security aspect. So now that we know who all the players are in elections, how do we secure the system? Um, I like to look at it as having three pieces. One is that statewide voter registration database. The other is voting equipment. Uh, and then training of our local election officials as well. So the statewide voter registration database. So we've already talked about this a little bit. The state built this technology, but the local clerks are required by law to use it. And so the statewide database is where all the data about elections is housed. Uh, it's where everybody's voter registration is. It's where all your addresses are maintained so that we know exactly with pinpoint accuracy what ballot you should receive. What districts and wards does your address fall into so we know what, what ballot to give you. All that happens in the statewide database. Um, one of the things I'm really proud of with that database is we actually built it ourselves. Uh, in other states, they have a vendor that does some of this work. Here in Wisconsin, because we have such a unique system, there just wasn't a product out there uh, that would work for us. And so we were able to build our own, and we secure it as well. And we've really been able to do some pretty incredible things with that security because it is our own, our own system. Um, so how do we secure that system? We work with our clerks, uh, first of all, to provide training. So they can't even get a username or a password until they take our cybersecurity training. Uh, they also have to use multi-factor authentication, which is having basically a password and another token before you can get into the system. And uh, they also have to have what we call an endpoint detection system on their device. And what that does is when their computer goes to log into the system, we're able to check their computer to make sure it doesn't have any viruses, uh, that it's up to date, uh, that there's no problems uh, before we'll let them log in. And that serves as a real help for them, too, to detect any problems and to protect our system as well. Um, so those are some of the efforts that we've been able to implement uh, in relation to that. All right. Uh, voting equipment. So this is always a topic that people are very interested in. So you know how we talked about how we have 1,850 cities, towns, and villages. Well, because of that, each of those jurisdictions under law, they can actually choose which voting equipment they would like to use. Um, so it has to be certified by the federal and the state government, which we'll talk about. But they can choose any equipment they'd like from that list. That's not the case in other states. In other states, a lot of times the state will purchase one type of equipment and everybody uses it. Here in Wisconsin, the clerks get to choose what they'd like to use. So there's no one type of equipment used in all communities. Uh, there's a number of different vendors and a number of different uh, types of equipment that are in use. Um, I think that's a real benefit. Uh, with all of our decentralized nature, I think it's a real benefit because it means if there were somebody looking to do harm to our system, that if they, they were able to impact one piece of equipment, they would do just that, impact one piece of equipment, uh, because they're all decentralized and not, not part of the same network or system. Um, so testing and certification is another thing that happens at the state and the federal level. So before a piece of equipment can be offered for uh, purchase here in the state of Wisconsin, first it has to be reviewed and certified by the US Election Assistance Commission. And they go out to an independent testing lab and have the code for all of that system reviewed, tested in a laboratory setting. The US Election Assistance Commission then reviews that report from the independent testing lab. And they're a four member commission, two Republicans and two Democrats. And they decide whether or not that equipment has met the standard for federal certification. Once they do that, uh, the system then comes to a state for certification. And we do much of the same. We go out and test that equipment and make sure that it is operating as required by law. Um, so we go out to multiple counties. We test all sorts of ballots in different scenarios, use different colored inks, folds on the ballot, you name it, to make sure that that equipment is operating appropriately. 
Uh, as part of the certification process, there is even a public demonstration where you can come and watch and be part of that test as well uh, in, your, in, your, uh, in our offices. Um, there's places in your community you can do it too, but for the state certification part, you can actually come to our office and see and review and test the new system. Uh, once all that's done, all of those reports go to our commission, and the commission is able to, in that public meeting, decide whether or not that system should be offered for use in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, the commission will also sometimes decertify systems. Uh, the most recent example is a system that used basically Scantron technology. So you had to use a number two pencil uh, to mark your ballot, and then it was able to use that number two lead to, to pick up who you voted for. The commission decided that that technology was no longer meeting modern standards. Not everybody has access to a number two pencil when they're voting absentee, and those ballots often had to be remade using the statutory process. And so they decided to decertify that piece of equipment. And so that's another thing that the commission can do when something's really reached its end of, of useful life. All right. Um, all voting equipment used in Wisconsin is tested by the commission and uh, tested by the federal government as well. But another thing, and this happens in your community, and this is something that you can actually go observe. In each of your communities, before an election, your voting equipment is required to be tested. So in the 10 days before an election, you can look for the notices in your community, and you can go down to the town hall, and you can actually see them test the voting equipment. So they're going to make sure that the voting equipment is processing and tabulating ballots the way that they're intended before that equipment can be used in the election. Um, so that's happening in every single community around Wisconsin in the 10 days before the election. So um, you know, for folks that have questions about that, want answers about that process, I encourage you to go to those tests. Uh, almost no one shows up to those tests. Um, at the state level or at the local level, we rarely see anybody come to those, those tests. And so um, please, if you have questions or know someone that does, you should check those out. Your clerk does a lot of work to make sure that um, you know, those public meetings are noticed. Uh, after an election, there are also audits of the voting equipment. And you could observe this as well. Uh, so the audits after the election is checking to make sure that the paper ballot matches the total on the voting equipment tape. Every single ballot cast in the state of Wisconsin has to have a paper trail. The paper ballot is the official artifact of the election. Uh, the, the printout, the tape from the voting equipment, if there were a recount or another challenge to the election, that would mean almost nothing. It's the paper ballots that the, are the official artifact of the election. And so during an audit of the, of the voting equipment after an election, what your poll workers, what your, your canvassers, your clerks are doing is they're going through and they're actually looking at the hand marked paper ballots and making sure that the voting equipment tabulated them correctly. And if there's any sort of discrepancy, uh, we've had some in the past where someone has used a pink colored pen and they put in, uh, you know, an X through the oval instead of filling it in and that didn't count appropriately, the commission looks at all of those things and determines whether or not it was an error of the voting system. Um, you can actually go and review these reports from all of the elections. So if you'd like to look at the one from 2020 or from previous elections, you can go and see those reports from the audit uh, and, and how those were determined. A lot of the times the commission will use them as training tools. Uh, we've never found an instance of there being machine failure, but we have found instances of human error uh, where humans have done something that's been unexpected uh, that the voting equipment couldn't account for. Uh, none of it has ever been significant enough uh, that it would have changed the outcome of an election. But again, I encourage folks to check that out in your communities. You're able to go to those audits and actually review, uh, be a part of the process. Uh, the commission does get, the, the state level commission does get to decide how many of those audits happen. Uh, it started out in 2016, they did 2% of the voting equipment statewide that was audited we're now up to 10%. Uh, so 10% of every machine in the entire state was audited after the 2020 election. And the commission, in their public meeting, determined that there was a 0% error rate 
uh, of, that, of that equipment. Uh, testing and certification. So yes, again, uh, the 10 days before the election, you can go and watch that process happen. Um, Canvas audits and public access. So in addition to those voting equipment checks, there's also what we call Canvas. And I know there's clerks in this room that will have a much better understanding of the Canvas process than even I do. Um, but the Canvas process is essentially a triple check on election results. Um, so on election night, did you know, and I hope people know this, but did you know that the numbers you see ticking across the news screen, those are entirely unofficial. Those are unofficial numbers that are coming in from media stringers, people that are at polling places calling into their news network. The results of an election are never official or final until about 30 days after the election because it has to go through these three levels of canvas to triple check the results. Uh, the first level is the municipal canvas. Uh, so in all of your communities on election night or the morning after the election, your canvassers are going to be meeting to make sure all the numbers of the election reconcile. So let's say you had fewer signatures in the poll book than you had ballots issued. So you have more ballots issued than you have signatures. Well, that doesn't make sense, right? You can't have that. Everybody has to sign the poll book before they're given a ballot. And so the canvassers actually have to figure out what happened. Did we make a mistake? Uh, did we forget to have somebody sign? What happened here? And they have to come up with explanations for that. And they have to you know, vote on whether or not that is um, you know, what, what should be reflected in the final total. Uh, they have to make sure they have enough voter registrations. Um, so let's say they have more ballots cast than they have registered voters. Again, a red flag. They can't have that, right? And so they have to go through and uh, figure that out, find out why. And the law has a process if there is just a mistake made, where a ballot was issued that shouldn't have been. There are different processes. One's called a drawdown, where one of those ballots is going to be removed from the total. Uh, but that's the first level. When they're done, they sign all the paperwork saying, these are our official numbers from our town, and they submit that to the county. The county has to go through all of that again. They have to make sure that all the numbers match. And if they find that the municipality has not explained an error, they can't certify it at the county level. They have to actually send it back down to the municipality and have them fix that error. And uh, that happens sometimes. And that's what Canvas is there for. It's there to catch those types of errors. It's really an important check on the process. Um, once that's been completed at the county level, then it comes to the state. We have to do the same. So we actually have to go through. And of course, we're looking at the entire state. So we're looking at it at a much higher level. But we have to make sure that there weren't more ballots issued than we have registered voters, that there weren't um, other issues with, with the data that's been provided to us. Once that canvas is completed, then the chairperson of the Wisconsin Elections Commission signs the final certification of the election as part of a public meeting. All those levels of Canvas, so at the municipal level, the county level, and the state level, you can actually watch all of that. You can be a part of all of that. You could even look to be selected as part of the canvassing board in some of your jurisdictions. And so all of those processes are things you can engage with to see that triple check on the numbers actually happening in your communities. Um, all right. So cybersecurity, um, we did touch on this you know, quite a bit, that there's, there's a lot of things that are happening at the federal, the state, and the local level to protect uh, cybersecurity. One of the things that we do is we practice these scenarios in, in real time before an election. Uh, so we have what's called tabletop exercises, uh, where we work with our clerks, with our law enforcement partners, with anybody that we're going to be coordinating with on election day, we actually think through what would a bad day in elections look like? Uh, what if somebody had a flood in their polling place? Um, in the last election, in, in 2022, there was a small jurisdiction outside of Madison that had something totally unrelated to the election. Uh, a person was disgruntled about a tree being cut down in their yard and shot a gun into the air. But it happened to be right by a polling place, and so they had to move the polling place in the middle of election day. And so those are the types of scenarios that we have to practice with our clerks to make sure we all know what we would do, 
how we'd communicate that to the public. And I'm happy to report that in that jurisdiction, they did a phenomenal job. That move was seamless. They were able to communicate with their public where to go. They had a backup location designated, and it went really, really smoothly. And um, I, I honestly think that our clerks around the state would do the same. They would do a really great job in those scenarios because they have contingency plans. They have backup plans, and we practice them. We make sure that everybody knows what they do if they had an issue. Uh, communications, uh, we also build in a lot of that training, com communications training uh, with our local election officials. What would you do in those scenarios to show the public you know, what's going on, to make sure there's transparency throughout? And so we do have guides and other information that our local clerks can use uh, if they are dealing with some type of emergency, some type of a crisis, to make sure that the public stays in the loop. Uh, you can't just have an emergency and close down your polling place and decide to go home for the day, right? You have to tell people what to do and where to go. And sometimes you even have to work with a court to make those determinations. Uh, so if the polling place has to be closed for a while, you, you might go to court and say, hey, we had to close for an hour. Can we stay open an extra hour tonight? Uh, and a court has to make that determination. The, the clerk can't make that on their own. OK, well, um, I think that's kind of the overview. I'm guessing that people are going to have questions. Um, so I do want to make sure that we've got plenty of time to answer any questions that folks might have. I've got one. Um, you're saying that the commission is consisting of three Republicans and three Democrats. Uh, who? It's two parts. One, who decides who gets to be on the commission? Yep. And is there room for an independent, a libertarian, a Green Party, um, you know, anything else? Yeah, that's a great question. So how do the commissioners get on the commission? Uh, they're appointed by legislative leadership. So on the Republican side, we're talking about the Speaker of the Assembly and the majority leader of the Senate, uh, they're able to make two appointments uh, to the commission. Then on the Democratic side, you've got the same sort of positions on the Democratic side, and those legislators make their appointments as well. And then two of the six commissioners, uh, they are former clerks. So two of the four commissioners are former clerks, either county clerks or municipal clerks, and they're actually designated through party lists. Uh, so the legislative leadership puts together a list of former clerks and says, these are the people we'd like you to consider. And then the governor gets to pick from the, the Republican list and the Democratic list. So that's how our commissioners come to be. And is there room for other parties? The statute does contemplate that, but it says that for someone to gain a seat on the commission, that that party would have to have, I think it's, it's a pretty large percentage of votes in the last general election. So let's say um, the Green Party or another party were to get 10% of the vote uh, in a general election, then they would get a seat on the commission. Okay. Raise your hand. Hi there. Um, I've been working the polls for a number of years, and so it's nice I get to kind of see what you're talking about, and I have seen. Um, but one of the things that has come up, I live on a, a half mile dead end rural road and as I'm working the polls I see three people in the books that haven't lived on the road for years. I have brought that to the attention of my county clerk and my municipal clerk and nobody seems to want to be responsible for re removing names. Uh, one is married, doesn't even live in the area, has a couple kids, it's been years. Another one lives out of state. This is a half mile dead end road. These people need to be removed. And I'm happy to hear now I know who's supposed to remove them. Uh, and I'll follow through with that. It sounds like it's the local municipality. Yep. And she said, I will not remove any names unless I get a list from, I think she said the WEC. So is somebody gonna be sending her a list? Is that, how does that happen, I guess, is my question. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. So your municipal clerk is the only one that has authority under statute to remove somebody, deactivate someone from the active list, people that can get a ballot. And uh, they can do so what the statute says. And you know, sometimes our statutes are confusing, right? And the statute says the clerk can do that based on reliable information. What does that mean, right? Um, and so 
if a clerk has, uh, if somebody runs into a clerk at the grocery store and says, hey, I think my neighbor moved, that's probably not going to cut it. I'm not saying that's what you did, but you know, I, you know that. But I think the the bar is getting that information from a reliable source. Um, it can sometimes be a mailing. So the clerk, a lot of times, the clerks will send a mailing to the voter, and if it gets returned on deliverable, you know that could be considered reliable information. Uh, we do also get some information on moves. Um, so if somebody has a different address in their DMV record than they have in their voter registration record, that gets flagged uh, through what's called ERIC. Uh, it's a consortium of states. And the clerk gets that information, and they could deactivate based on that information. Um, I will tell you, though, there is also some other complications uh, as well. Our law allows for what's called intent to return, which means that if somebody has moved away, but in their mind they say, I'm always coming back to Wapaka. Wapaka is my home. I'm going to go back there. Uh, we might know that they're never actually going to go back there, but if they have intent to return and they don't register somewhere else, uh, then they can continue to vote from that address. So I would work with your municipal clerk and, yeah, and, uh, um, you know, if, if, if that information is flagged, if that person does have a different address in their voter, or in their voter record than their DMV record, then they will get that information from us. That comes from Eric to the WEC, then to the local clerk. Yep. Yeah, Th thanks for bringing up observers, because I think you know, observers are a really important part of the process, right? They're there to make sure that there's accountability on the process. Uh, the law does have uh, some parameters, but they're pretty vague. It says that observers can go to the polls, they can observe parts of the election process, they have to stay three to eight feet away. That's really all it says. Um, I'm really proud of the commission that they just made a determination that they're going to submit an administrative rule. And what that is, is it's clarifying fine points of the law. And as part of creating that administrative rule around what observers should be able to see, where they can stand, can they sit, all these things, they've actually developed this committee, an advisory committee, and it spans the entire political spectrum. People that probably wouldn't uh, want to sit down with each other in a room normally are all working on this committee together to provide input to the commission about what this rule should look like. And so I think our clerks do a great job with the observer process now, but I really think that this rule is going to help clarify the process even more and make it so that everybody knows exactly what they can and can't do, what they have a right to see, and make sure that they're not interfering with the, the voter's experience at the same time. Uh, Megan, a question for you and perhaps the others that are, are clerks and, and poll workers uh, uh, here. What's the sense, what's the morale among people that are, are, are working the polls, working, you know, the working clerks given, uh, got be, uh, bad uh, uh, ink, the nickel dime harassment that we read about in the newspapers sometime? What, what, where's the heads of these folks around these issues? Thanks for that question. You know, <laughs> what I've, I've kind of taken to saying is running elections in Wisconsin, it's hard. You know, for all of us that have run an election in Wisconsin, it's, it's difficult, it's hard, uh, it's tough. But thankfully, Wisconsin's election officials are tougher. And uh, I think that we all have a real resolve on serving our communities, making sure that elections are delivered fairly. You know, I'll, I'll tell you from my own personal perspective, I really uh, sympathize with and um, I wish that I could provide information to every person in Wisconsin that had concerns. Not to try to change their mind, but to make sure they had exposure to that information. And I think the clerks feel the same way. You know, we just, we want people to have access to that information. We want to serve our communities. Um, so I think it's a really hard job. It's a really tough job. But I also think it's a really important job that uh, a lot of us really feel um, honored to be able to do, even if there's hard days. So, okay. 
Um, hi. hi. <coughs> Could would you please explain what happened to the Gableman report and why have we not? Uh, what's what happened to it? And sure. You know, I don't know. That was something that was uh, ordered by the assembly, and that the assembly chose not to um, do anything additional, is my understanding. But it's not something within the purview of the WEC. It was a legislative um, initiative, so that they they did not uh, continue any further. I thought my voice changed on the last one. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, so I'm Laura, and I've, I've lived in Wapaka about a year, but uh, I have two concerns. One is my last three uh, votes, not from Wapaka, but out of what a Winnebago, because I was a nominal. Okay. Um, I have never had an absentee ballot. I have never requested an absentee ballot. I've never voted but on the voting day. <coughs> All three of my last votes prior to Wapaka show up as absentee. I brought it to the office attention. Yeah. I got the runaround for months. Finally got involved the honorable. Eventually I was told it's destroyed the ballot. So that's yeah. one concern. So there are mistakes. Yep. And I'm listening to this and it sounds like everything's great. We do have great, but there are mistakes. Yep. You're right. Secondly, I'm very concerned with the absentee ballot or, or the ballot box. The drop boxes. Yeah. I think those are absolutely crazy, and, they, and the laws have to change around that. And that's about it. So the drop boxes, and there are mistakes there. I don't want yeah us to pretend there aren't. Yeah, no, that's a Thank totally you. fair question. You know, I think uh, it, it, there's certainly mistakes made. You know, there's thousands of people involved in the process. We've got 1,850 clerks, 72 county clerks. On a general election day, there will be 40,000 poll workers, right? And so I think you're absolutely right. But three elections. Yeah. So it's, you know, there was three different elections. So how is that possible? Because I'm listening to you say yeah. that it had to be approved through the clerk. Yep. So how is it there's three absentee ballots ready to put in? I've never had an absentee ballot. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I would have to get you. I, I, and I'd be glad to. We can even look into it, too, into your information. But I don't know without looking at the record exactly what would have happened. My guess, and this would be nothing more than a guess, is that, did you actually vote in those those elections? In person. Yeah, is that when they recorded it, they chose the wrong method All in the system. All three times in several years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, only your clerk would be able to answer that, Thank would have you. the poll book, so. Uh, as a former pastor from the South Side of Chicago, I love the fact that my church was my polling place. And the question, well, I have two. One is, how are polling places decided? The second, a little more sensitive, are you able to say anything about what's happening to you in the past month? Sure, no, thank you. Those are both great questions. Um, so in terms of how polling places are chosen, uh, your municipal clerk gets to choose the polling places. Uh, and they're actually designated uh, in your jurisdiction. There's a notice that goes out that says these are the places that we've chosen. If they want to change them, uh, or when they solidify them, they do have to work with their governing body too. So if they have a city council or another entity, uh, those, those are done as well before they issue the notice. Uh, when they're looking for polling places, they're looking for things that are accessible, that have enough room, all the things that make a good polling place. In some communities, it's really, really hard. In a lot of small rural communities, the clerk doesn't even have an office. Um, so we have 1,200 townships in the state of Wisconsin. And in most of those townships, your clerk only works maybe five hours a week. Their jurisdiction only gives them you know, pay for five hours a week. And they're not given an office, and so they work out of their home. And so in some of these places, there aren't great options. They might have to use the town hall that has accessibility issues. But I think a lot of our jurisdictions try to do the best they can to find uh, polling places that will work well uh, for their, their jurisdictions. Um, in terms of my position, you know, um, I think, as I said here, uh, I serve at the will of my commission. And uh, as I'm sure you've seen in the news, 
the commission believes that they have a procedural deadlock. I don't have a vote on the commission. Quite frankly, I was disappointed uh, that we found ourselves in this, this gridlock. Uh, but they believe that um, three commissioners uh, believe that the recent state Supreme Court decision, the Frederick Prane decision, uh, changed the way that appointed positions are made. And that decision said that appointed officials get to stay in their position unless the governing body were to sort of choose to remove them. And so three of the commissioners decided it wasn't even an appropriate thing for them to vote on uh, because of that new Supreme Court decision. Let me tell you how disappointed I am that we're the first state agency that has to figure this out, right? Um, you know, if somebody else could have gone first and figured out what does this new case mean for positions, um, I would have really been appreciative of that. Um, so right now, the, the state's attorney general has filed uh, in court asking a court to decide what to do here. Uh, we're the first agency that has had to new, use this new ruling. What do we do? And so I'm just waiting for the court to make that decision, and I will respect you know, whatever decision they make. Um, a lot of the other things that have happened have been political. And my job is actually, I'm required by law to be nonpartisan. So when political people say, do this, do that, we, we're, we're saying that this, you have to do this thing, I can't. I can't do that. I'm required to be nonpartisan. But a court will be able to give us that clarity uh, that we, we really need. Um, and I hope that we get that quickly, even if it's not in my favor. Oh, OK. Uh, just curious about how late you accept ballots because yeah. uh, she's mentioning drop boxes and such. Yep. Um, and I don't know what kind of a time it takes for all the ballots to come through. You would mention that it takes 30 days to review everything. Yep. Is there a cutoff time to accept the ballot? That's a really excellent question. I should have brought that up. So all ballots must be received by 8 p.m. on election day to be counted. So yeah, the state legislature changed the law in, I believe, 2017. There used to be late return allowed for military and overseas and other groups. Uh, but the law was changed, and it said all ballots have to be back in the hands of your clerk by 8 PM, or they can't be counted. So there's no, if it's postmarked by election day and received a week later, those can't be counted. If it's not at your polling place to be counted by 8 PM, then it can't be counted. There's no late arriving absentees in Wisconsin. That's very different than in other states. There's other states where you do postmark by election day, and you have a week, 10 days for that to get back to your clerk. And so it gets really confusing when you're hearing the news, because every state is so different on that. But in Wisconsin, if the ballot's not back by 8 PM, it can't be counted. And there aren't any exceptions, even for our military voters. Hi. Um, in many of our municipalities uh, around here, including mine, Farmington, uh, we have Dominion voting machines. My understanding is they have the ability to be connected to the internet. Is that correct? So I think what, that, that's a really good question. And I think where that comes from is that there are some systems, not just Dominion, but all voting equipment vendors, that have what's called a modem. And what a modem is, is on election night, the law says the clerk has to get the unofficial results. So what is your unofficial results to your county clerk to post it on the website uh, on election night? And the municipal clerk can choose by law different ways to get those unofficial numbers to their county clerk. In some jurisdictions, they call up their county clerk and they say, I've got this many votes for this candidate, this many votes for that candidate. In other places, they send an email. In modem jurisdictions, on election night, they're able to, in an encrypted way, send those unofficial numbers to the county clerk uh, using an encrypted cellular network. And that is all that it does, and it's unofficial. Uh, if somebody were, let's say somebody did, it's, it's, a, it's a secure encrypted process. But let's say somebody was able to tamper with that, and they did interfere with that modem transmission. Those numbers are totally unofficial. If the county clerk got a different result than the paper ballot showed, 
during the Canvas process, that would very quickly come out that the numbers that were sent to them by modem, by email, by telephone were wrong because that's not what the Canvas statement is showing. And so, no, the voting equipment is not connected to a network, to an internet, but one of the methods, unofficial results, can be sent from a polling place to a county to be posted for the public is by a, a modem transmission. So, Thank and that's, you. that's not just Dominion, it's all uh, system vendors. Hi, I think this is on, yeah. Uh, related to that box and the whole bit, from has he ever looked at uh, you know transferring money? You can do it electronically, thousands uh, voting for board of directors. You go into a website, you put your passwords, and this we're doing massive amounts of this. Has Wisconsin ever looked at uh, basically doing electronic submissions without the absentee ballot process? Yeah, so electronic voting, it's certainly a hot topic and something we get questions on all the time. First of all, there'd have to be really major overhauls to federal and state law before that could happen. But it is something, you know, military voters ask me about it all the time. You know, college, all kinds of people are asking about it all the time. So it's a great question, but the law would have to change for that to happen. Secondly, one of the differences we have with uh, voting versus things like banking or other things is A, there's no insurance for voting, right? For, for your money, when you're doing that electronic transfer, you've got a receipt. If you had a problem, you could go back and say, hey, you didn't do this right. Uh, and there's insurance to back that up to make sure you get your claim. With voting, the vote has to be entirely anonymous, right? So we don't track who you voted for. And so there would be no way for you to come back and say, hey, wait a minute, uh, what I submitted electronically got changed. You, we wouldn't know that because of the anonymity anonymity. You have to be anonymous, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, so that would, uh, you know, that, that's why it's really different uh, from those other systems. I think probably the technology exists. Uh, one of the other things that's happened is there have been pilot programs uh, where they've looked at, is there a way for us to meaningfully show a voter that the vote you submitted is part of the vote total without giving them a receipt that says, I voted for so-and-so, because that wouldn't work, right? Because then people could pay people for votes and other things. So you can't have like a receipt you give people. But is there a way to show your vote in the total? And there probably are some really smart people that have technology that would be able to do that. But how do you explain that to the general public in a way that would be meaningful has been a real, real challenge. So I, I expect that those are going to be conversations that continue into the future. Um, and, you know, um, hopefully down the road, uh, if that is considered, there'll be some very carefully crafted laws that will um, help to, to make sure that process is done well. I am one of the chief inspectors in the town of Farmington. Yeah. I wanted to speak to the question on the morale first. I can only speak for my township and some other workers that I know throughout the county, yeah. um, the morale is great. We have a great team of people that work the elections. Um, granted, some of those elections are pretty hectic. The gubernatorial elections and the presidential, obviously, are, they're hectic. They're very long days, but we have a great team of people who are dedicated to making sure that it's done correctly, and it is done correctly every time. And then along that vein, if you are skeptical at all, I would invite you to see your clerk about working the elections because we always need people. Yep, awesome points. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you so much for serving as a poll worker. Um, I think those are great points. You know, election day at the polls, I mean, I love going to visit polling places because it's always such a festive environment. Usually the poll workers are having a potluck. It's, it's a really, it's a community thing, right? Uh, those are your neighbors and your friends there uh, supporting their community. And so it's a pretty cool thing. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, hi. Uh, just to follow up regarding voter rolls. So I'm a, I'm a poll worker also with my neighbor. And uh, my daughter is one of the people on our road that has been on the books for four years now okay but has not lived in our home anymore she hasn't has a, has a home down in uh, yep. southern Milwaukee or southern Wisconsin but anyway I guess um, you know the frustration is the fact that we see uh, people that don't belong in the voter rolls but our clerk seems to be uh, 
elusive in doing what we feel should be done, is, and that's to remove those people, especially yeah. when they've been there multiple through multiple uh, elections. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And then kind of the follow-up for that, I was, um, I was involved in a recount, or I was an observer in a recount, and I saw, I saw uh, it, it had to do with uh, our local school board, and I saw a couple of votes that, had, that were basically cast that uh, there was no physical home in that location that somebody was living at. Yep. So, you know, that... It got resolved, but it you know that was something I saw. And then I guess going back to the 2020 election, you know uh, I think maybe and maybe you could kind of comment on this, but I seem to remember that the question I, I directed to one of our state senators was about um, looking at uh, you know uh, where there was multiple uh, residences for an individual. And they said there was like over 250,000 of those. And they did investigate them, and they narrowed that down to, like I think you had mentioned, it has to do with people registering their vehicles right. in two different uh, counties. Mm -hmm. And they said they uh, this aide of the senator told me that they narrowed it down to about 70,000 that there was, you know, they, they couldn't account for those. So I guess uh, maybe you could address that. Yeah. That was from 2020 election that I was calling on. OK. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. To your first point, um, there is a process called uh, the formal complaint process. And it's as exciting as it sounds, unfortunately. Um, but Wisconsin State Statute 5.05 and 5.06 prescribe these processes whereby if you observe something uh, illegal happening pertaining to voting, or if you think an election official has not performed their duties appropriately, you're able to file a, a sworn complaint. Um, so if there's an avenue at which you feel like you've met a dead end with getting answers to your questions and you want to initiate that process, you can go on our website, which is elections.wi.gov, and look for complaints. 5.05 complaints, those are where there's been some kind of criminal wrongdoing. So let's say somebody intentionally committed voter fraud. Um, with 5.06 complaints, that's if you think an election official has not performed their duties appropriately. And you can write out what you, your, your grievance is. Yep, it can be a county clerk, a uh, municipal clerk, or a poll worker. Yep, yep. And uh, you can outline what that is, the actions you've already taken. And then you do have to swear to that information. And then it goes to the commission to decide. And if you don't like what the commission decides, so sometimes people say, I don't agree with what the bipartisan commission decided, uh, then you can actually take that to, to court, too. But usually, in the case of 506 complaints, where it's a clerk that hasn't performed a responsibility, in most cases, the commission will say, you didn't do this correctly. You need to do it correctly moving forward, and they'll issue that uh, letter and that directive. So that is an option uh, for those types of instances. So, and in terms of the the addresses that don't exist, um, you know, we have looked into every claim that has been brought to us. Um, you can go onto our website too and find where people have made these claims about you know people that don't live at addresses, all sorts of things, and we have looked into those and examined those. Um, and in a lot of cases, the, the information was not good information. And I'm not saying that to disparage anybody. I'm saying that because addressing is actually a really complicated process. Uh, in some of the instances, folks said, we've got you know 500 people that are registered at a UPS box, or a UPS store. And they sent us the image of the UPS store, and they sent us all the people registered there. Well, we went on to Google Maps, and we put in the UPS store, zoom out, and you find the UPS store is in the bottom of a giant apartment complex. And so there was actually a reason for that. And I'm not, you know, and again, I'm not saying that to discount these things, but we do take them seriously. And when those claims come to our attention, we work with the clerks to look into them. Um, now, sometimes there are people that have, you know, moved from a jurisdiction and shouldn't be continuing to vote there. And those should be dealt with on a local level using that reliable information. So, 
I have a question. Um, who's responsible to enforce the rules about not um, influencing voters? There's a distance rule. I can't remember if it's yep. 50 or 250 or 500 feet. Uh, is that the clerk? Uh, who monitors that and enforces it? Yeah, so there's an electioneering zone, so you can't wear any sort of political apparel, have political signs uh, around a polling place or a place where voting is being conducted. And it's the chief inspector of each polling place that's in charge of making sure that that happens, right? If somebody is not uh, abiding by that law, then they would work with that person, hopefully, to just resolve it and say, hey, you can't be here, you need to move back a little. Uh, but if somebody doesn't, then they can work with law enforcement to resolve that. Ultimately, if a voter feels like that wasn't handled appropriately or there was interference, uh, then they could file a complaint, like we talked about, too, uh, where they, that could be examined. But it is the chief inspector, which is the person in charge of every polling place. Earlier you said someone who wants to continue voting in Wisconsin but has moved away because they plan on coming back. Well, what would stop them from voting in another state as well as here? Yes. Why wouldn't they have to just get off their rolls and then re, re uh, sign up for voting when they return to the state? That's, that's an excellent question. Thank you for that. So what the law says, and I didn't write it, right? <laughs> but the law says that if you have, let's say you're, um, you're, you've decided to move to Florida. You said Wisconsin winters have gotten to be too much for me. I'm going to move to Florida. I'm not going to register to vote there because Wisconsin's my home, right? Wisconsin's my home. I plan to go back there eventually. I'm just taking a break in Florida. The law says that as long as you don't re-register in Florida, you can continue to vote uh, as a Wisconsin voter if you have intent to return. Now, if you, <laughs> yeah, and now, but if you move to Florida and you have no intent to move back, then you're absolutely right. You should be re-registering to vote in Florida. How do we catch it? Uh, so there is a tool that we have to catch it uh, that has been the subject of some controversy, and that's called ERIC, the Electronic Registration Information Center. And what ERIC does is states submit their data from their voter rolls. Um, and you do this in an encrypted way. It's not just the data itself. And ERIC looks for people that are registered in multiple states. And if we find that somebody's registered in multiple states, then we're able to remove them uh, from the list where they don't reside anymore. Even better yet, Eric allows us to see if somebody has actually like broken the law and they voted in two states, we're able to catch that through Eric. And every year, the commission is able to make referrals uh, to the district attorneys uh, for the small number of people that choose to break the law and vote in two places. Uh, but if we didn't have Eric, we wouldn't have a way to compare voter lists uh, with other states. Oh, thank you. I, you said earlier that uh, we were the only state that closed our polls at 8 p.m. And uh, I'm not asking you to explain it, because I have my own thoughts about the whole thing. But I, I just think there is some thought-provoking issue there to say that. I mean, there's been various things that have restricted voting uh, over the recent years. One was. Um, larger cities would have polls uh, open earlier in the season so people could vote sooner for a longer number of days. And uh, that was limited severely because uh, I heard a rationale coming out of some the legislature in Madison that was limited because all municipalities couldn't offer that much time, therefore nobody could offer it. I don't get that. But to limit our time, if you're standing in line waiting to vote, but you can't get in until 8 o'clock, that should be, I don't know, unconstitutional or something. Everybody should vote, and we should provide an opportunity for everybody to vote. We should go out of our way to make sure they do. And I like the electronic uh, issue. However, I think it skips over something much more attainable and, and being functional right now in our country is mail-in voting. Several states have mail-in voting and they get 90% people respond. And in those states, they seem to think there's uh, no cheating going on. So what the heck's wrong with us just doing that? Additionally, um, the, uh, the observers, is there any qualifications or 
registration, people have to go through, they be one of those observers. And I know you expressed uh, pride or appreciation for um, the formality or supervision of the observers. Personally, I find it quite insulting. I want to go vote without anybody looking over my shoulder. I, I think that's my right to go there unaccosted, and I don't appreciate being watched. That's just my own two cents on that. And um, I hope I'm not going to forget my last point now. But uh, oh, yes. I thought of it. You poor people have to listen to me. We're all required, and most people hate it and whine about it, but we're all required as citizens of the country we say we're so proud in to do jury duty, right? But everybody whines about it, finds ways of dodging it, so be it. But why don't we get people required to be poll workers? Because to me, I only did it for a while. I was curious what it was going to be like when I did it. You didn't get the wrong, didn't, did not get to sit there and complain about the other person's politics because everybody was so sacrosanct about doing it right and making sure things were as fantastic as we wanted them to be in this country. And that's all I saw. I mean, it got kind of boring sometimes, really sitting around or counting all those ballots at 10 o'clock at night. But I think if everybody had a chance to go down there and see the respect every single citizen has who serves there, there may be less controversy. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. One thing I just wanted to make sure I clarified is absentee ballots, so those ballots by mail have to be in the hands of the clerk by 8 p.m. to be counted. If you're voting in, per in person at the polls, you have to be in line by 8 o'clock. So as long as you're in line by 8 o'clock, uh, there's actually a poll worker that comes out. They're going to wear a vest. They're going to mark the end of the line, um, but you're still able to vote. So let's say you're someplace where there's a you know, it happens sometimes where at 8 o'clock there's still a two-hour line, but everybody was there by, by 8, then uh, they're able to do that. But nobody can come into the line after 8 o'clock. So. <coughs> Last question? Last one. Yeah. Last question. Uh, since there's limited forms of identification that is allowed for voting, for registering, the, our driver's license and our state IDs, is there, a recon, is there an automatic reconcile um, with the voting rolls through DMV and the, the actual voting rolls? That's a really good question and a complicated answer that I'll try to keep succinct. So there's what's called the National Voter Registration Act. And there are only six states in the country that are exempt from it. Wisconsin's one of them. And the National Voter Registration Act requires there to be a connection between the DMV and the state election entity. Um, we're exempt from that, so that means there is not really an interface between the two agencies. There is one place, though, and this is a real-time check. Uh, so we have a state law that says online voter registration is allowed. So if anybody wants to register to vote uh, and they want to fill out the form online, they have to match all their information with the DMV, and we do have a real-time verification. We also, after somebody registers to vote, there's what's called sort of informally a HAVA check, uh, which is comparing the voter's registration information with what's on file with DMV. And if, there's, if th there aren't matches, that gets flagged for the clerk so that they can follow up with the voter uh, to get it corrected or to you know, deactivate the registration. So there are some places where we check the data with DMV, but there's not automatic voter registration. So if you go to the DMV to update your driver license, that's not going to transfer over to your voter record. So, One more question, Megan. Um, how do people in the military ensure from Wisconsin that they have the ability to vote? Yeah, that's a great question. I've had um, some really cool opportunities to work with Department of Defense and to go to different military installations. And you wouldn't believe the challenge, oh, I'm sure many of you would if you've, you've served, but the, yeah, the challenges that some of the, our military voters face in requesting and receiving their ballots. I was on an aircraft carrier once where they said a helicopter came out to sea to pick up their bag of ballots. And as it was flying away with a bag of mail, it dropped into the ocean. Oh. And so, um, you know, there, there is not the ability for our military voters to, uh, to vote online, right? They have to send back their ballot in paper form. Our law doesn't allow for electronic return. 
In 35 states, there is electronic return for military voters. Wisconsin isn't one of those places. But Wisconsin does have some other options, so it has to go back in paper. But they also can fill out what's called a federal write-in ballot, which is basically an emergency backup ballot that they send before they know all the contests on the ballot. So let's say they just want to vote for president, uh, and they want to make sure that that vote gets counted. They can fill in the write-in ballot, and that will get counted if we never get back their, their full ballot. If it gets dropped into the ocean, uh, at least they'll have that write-in ballot that will count. Um, but uh, yeah, we don't allow for electronic return. Um, they can make an electronic request, uh, so our military voters can at least tell their clerk electronically that they'd like to receive a ballot. Did you want to? Go ahead. I, I would just want to give, we're going to cut off Q&A. Yep. It's getting close yep. to time. Um, just want to give you an opportunity to make some closing remarks and um, maybe let us all know what, what we can do to help. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I mean, I think events like this, I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Even the tough questions, I love having these conversations. And I think you'll find that your local election officials do too. And so if you have questions, I would really encourage you to get involved. Uh, go see these processes for yourself. Talk to your city, town, village, or county clerk about these things. Uh, get answers to your questions. Um, and you know, if, if you feel like you're not getting an answer, reach out to us too. There may be other avenues that we can explore. But I really appreciate you all taking all this time out of your evening to come learn more about elections. Um, I'm, I'm just so happy to have had this opportunity to talk to all of you. So thank you all uh, for engaging. Thank you, Megan.